We are with the great, the one and only Israel Yisrael Yami Shechter Yami. Thank you for letting us go behind the beam with you. We're so excited to be together. Why don't you start out by telling us how you got the name Yummy? When did that nickname begin? Oh my gosh. Did you not have my father on? Why didn't you ask him that question? Well, of all the things you could have asked him, that wasn't that wasn't on the top of your list. That didn't, that didn't make the top of the list. Mr. Bura versus Archa Shulchan. You know, we didn't get to the Yummy. Um, my Hebrew name is Yisrael Moshe, and I think Yod Mem. I don't know. It started when I was born. I had nothing to do with it. There's no so great story behind it. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Started as far back as you remember. And who was Israel? Yeah. Was it was that after the country Israel or your father's big? No, big my mother's grandfather was Israel. My father's grandfather was Moshe, um, and that's it. Again, now you, very you, you exciting story to kick off this behind the bima episode with. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it is an exciting question to start with because you've built this extraordinary extraordinary business it's a business but really it's the business of helping others charity bids you've raised 200 million dollars according to your website i'm sure it's actually much more since then you need to update your website but you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for worthy nonprofits in the jewish world the non-jewish world when you operate out there in the non-jewish world or the secular jewish world do they wonder like yummy like is that your favorite food or you like to eat or where does yummy come from do you have to explain your name a lot I don't explain it because I don't go by that name in the outside world. So it's like, you know me since I'm a kid, so you know, but it's it's not a name that I lead with. Um, and then the people who somehow find out, they think it's cute. They think it's funny. Uh, but I will correct you, and I will check my website also. I'm going to have people look at that. But we raised uh, $200 million during COVID alone for charities. Wow. So having, so we're, having we're, raised we're over $200 out million, out there, but it's something I'm very, very proud of. Sorry? Yeah. Incredible. It doesn't say COVID. It says having raised okay, 200 so we have million. to correct it, but it's something I'm incredibly proud about that during COVID, that's what we did during COVID alone. So I'm very proud of my team for that. And we will update that accordingly. That, it's incredible. So, Yami, tell us, how, how'd you get into that? You're in the business of helping other businesses do their business well, which is to empower others is an amazing thing. And to the tune and the numbers that you have, we went to the United Hotel event recently here in South Florida, a magnificent, incredible event. We know that you were part of that. You you helped launch that and ran that. The Amudim campaign and so many others, the Jewish and non-Jewish world. How'd you first get into this? It's a good question. I think... Um... I, I think I would attribute this to my parents. Um, my parents are, I've recently said this to somebody else, so that's why it's fresh on my mind. But, you know, my parents, everybody knows my parents, but people don't know my parents because they are wealthy. My parents are not wealthy. But I would still argue to say that my parents are amongst the most generous people I've ever met in my life. So I learned from a very young age, just from growing up in my house and seeing by osmosis, that being charitable and being generous has no correlation to how much money you have in the bank. And you could be incredibly generous with your time, with your ideas, with your contacts, if you just put people and ideas together. And that's what I saw my parents doing my entire life. As a kid, people were always coming over to the house, whether it be personal issues or communal issues or whatever it is. And all I saw is them helping and giving. So I was already producing charity events when I was a kid. Uh, you mentioned that Salah, United at Salah. Ellie Beer came to meet me. Aviad Goldbicht introduced me to Ellie Beer when I was a freshman in YU. Wow. And Ellie yeah. Beer was a partner in running Hatzalah Yerushalayim at the time. That's how he long. He had an I've idea. <laughs> no, that's how long I've been involved with. I, I was involved with United at Salah from the ground up before there was a United at Salah. But again, that that wasn't from, you know, any training I had. It was just what I saw at home. This is something that has to be done. How do we get there? Who do we connect? Who's, you know, who's got good ideas? Who's got the funding? Let's put everyone together. And that's kind of where it started. That, that is amazing. And and everyone knows, but for those who may not, we're, of course, talking about Rav and Rebetzin Shechter, of Herschel Shechter, Rosh Hashiva, Posik, one of the gedolim of our of our time. And yeah, as a Talmud of Rav Shechter, I know that he's gone out of his way. He has no time, but he'll make time to make a phone call, to make an introduction for something he thinks worthy. People show up here on behalf of institutions or causes. They show a letter that Rav Shechter wrote. And, and one more story, which Yami you can maybe, maybe even collaborate. I heard it from your brother is a story of a yeshiva that wanted Rav Shechter to make an introduction 
to a philanthropist who can make a nice donation. And when Schechter said, yeah, you know, I'll be in Brooklyn. I give a shear there once a week. Let me check out the yeshiva. When I see it firsthand, I'll be in a better position to be more persuasive when I asked that person to help. And he got a phone call back that said, you know, the yeshiva is not really your hashkafa. I don't know if it would be good if you come. If you could just make the phone call without coming. Anyone else would have hung up on such a person. What a chutzpah. But My Rav Shechter, Lord, 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 he, he, uh, he was prepared to make the phone call afterwards. Your mother, the Rebetzin, was a little frustrated and objected. And what I understand is when your brother spoke to Rav Asher Weiss about it, his answer was that your father, your, your mother is right and your father is righteous. Your mother was right, and your father is righteous, uh, which is a good description of both of them in general. But that's just how far his generosity goes to even work for a cause that doesn't fully accept him. But he doesn't care. It was learning Torah. It was valuable. It's an amazing story in its own right. Yes. So that, that's what inspires your work in Charity Bids. But how did you actually get into it? You graduate college. You graduate YU. You finish with Yeshiva. What's your career path that leads you to found a organization that's entirely about raising money for others? It was never a plan, to be honest. Uh, I was being called by a lot of organizations. You know, there were organizations that I took on my own to help out and to do events for. And as those became more successful, uh, I was getting calls from all sorts of other organizations. And as much as I'd like to help everybody, I just wasn't in a position to do everything for everybody. Um, and I kind of figured that without you know, setting up, setting this up as somewhat of a business, then I'm never going to be able to help as many people as I would like to. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, the business that we have today is not where it started. This is, this has evolved over the years and kind of addressing the needs of, of the community and what things have been throwing, thrown at us. But that's, that's basically how it started. It was, there was never a plan to be in this business ever. Um, and I was on the other side of this business you know, not on the business side for my whole life um, until this accidentally turned into a business. So it, it's a very crowded space, the world of the world of online marketing and fundraising. How do you differentiate what what Charity Bids does versus all the other programs out there? So first of all, what Charity Bids, in essence, the main the, the main company that we started, uh, we first started as an online auction platform for charities kind of like an eBay for charities. Um, and that at the time was not a business. So that was set up really just to help as many charities as possible. This was in 2008 when the economy started to tank and you know we were trying to educate charities that if people aren't giving as much money, they'd probably give gifts in kind. You'll be surprised how much they make and things like that. So we started there. Uh, then what happened was because basically I built that platform with two partners, we, we built that platform coming from the side of volunteer fundraisers for and people who have been involved in community and organizations for so many years, not what, what should we build that would make a successful business? What could we build that would actually address the needs and concerns of the organizations using it? So we spent right. a tremendous amount of time and money and effort and energy building something that we thought would be good for the organization's branding and data generation and, uh, navigation and things like that. And essentially what happened was we put out this amazing platform, but the average charity doesn't care. They just need to make money. They don't care about the branding and the data generation. So essentially what happened was the, the first, the clients we had after we spent an entire year building this platform were our first clients were Michael Jordan and Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman and Tom Hanks, people who understood like how genius this platform was and how, Instead of them sending all of their fans and all of their followers, which is their most valuable asset to third party websites to do whatever campaigns they want to do, we could do it all under their brand, on their websites, on their Facebook pages, whatever it was. Um, we, now you, they, this was ju just to clarify, Michael Jordan wasn't raising money for himself, meaning there was a there was a charity no, no, no. he cared about. Yeah, but the people who ended up using our platform were Hollywood studios and radio stations, like people who understood how godless this platform was. The issue is that's not who we built it for. And I'm not here to do a chesed for people who could afford to do so. Um, basically, the charities who we actually built this for were then coming to us and say, well, we'd love to use your platform. Could you help us solicit product? I'm not going to solicit product on behalf of everybody's uh, organization. So we started referring them to companies that offer consignment. So there's, there's no risk consignment business. It's a very big business. And there are charities who run auctions and they could take without any risk. They could do, they could get art, they could get jewelry, they could get memorabilia, they could get trips and experience. So we started 
all the charities who were using our platform, we were referring them to other companies that did this. And very quickly, we realized that we shouldn't be referring people to companies where we can't vouch for the product. I don't know how uh -huh. much the jewelry is worth. I don't know what art is being sold. I don't know the authenticity of the product. Let's just stick to trips and experiences. So, uh, you know, after two years or so of referring them to other companies that were doing it, I kind of realized, you know what, I have the relationships and I have the experience and I've traveled a lot more than the people selling these things. Why don't I start my own business doing this? And we ended up basically slowly wound down on the technology side of what we were offering. Um, and I started what's now charity biz became at least until COVID um, we offer unique trips and experiences on consignment to charities running auctions. So we service about 1500 charities a year, I'd say. Wow. And then overnight by COVID, uh, we were out of business and we had to recreate on our entire business and change uh, direction very quickly. And we ended up using the relationships that we have and the experience we have in fundraising and, and community and production um, to produce. We produced uh, over 100 virtual events for nonprofits during COVID. And then I guess when COVID was over, our consignment business came back. But also a lot of the people who had seen our work during COVID in the virtual event space assumed that the only reason we were in the virtual event production space was because they obviously were producing real events before COVID. So after COVID, we've been asked now, we have a whole production company now that produces live in-person events. So it kind of mushroomed over the years. It was never the plan. I never wanted to be in this industry, but I'm very happy I stumbled on it because it's very, very rewarding. And, and is there a template that you follow and you basically recreate the same events or some creativity has to kick in each, whether it's the Wayu Hanukkah event, the United Hetzal event, or, you know, the next organization that's going to call you, you have to think out of the box and get really creative and do something no one has done before. Because the truth is, as, as the people invited and who attend these events, you know, everyone knows they're miserable. Nobody wants to go to the next dinner. Like how many times are you going to hear that comedian, that singer, that MC start with the same corny jokes. And again, we, we have to host one of those dinners shortly. So I'm not knocking it. We want people to come, but how do you, how do you think out of the box each time that someone's like, that's something I want to go to, not something I feel I have to go to. So first of all, you're saying something that's very, very, very true. People are sick of going to dinners. They don't have the patience. They don't have the the attention span and certainly after COVID people are being a lot more picky about what they attend and why they attend and how many they attend. That's for sure. Um, but I would never want to do the same event twice for two organizations. Right. Hey, it doesn't work because each organization has completely different needs. Uh, there's different things they want to accomplish. There's different audiences. There's different things they've done in the past. There's different things they're trying to achieve. It just doesn't work. Uh, but B, I'd be miserable if I was doing the same thing day in, day out. So unless I'm constantly creating, you know, it just it just wouldn't work for me. Um, you know, I, I recently did an event. I produced a big event recently and there was a gentleman there who's very successful in uh, the real estate space. And he said to me, uh, someone once told me that I'm the best in class and they probably thought they were complimenting me. But in fact, they really ruined my day. I said, why? He said, because my whole life, all I did was work to be the only one in my class. And mm -hmm. in one in one sentence, this guy just put me along with everybody else. So he said mm -hmm. to me, now that I've experienced your event, I could tell you you're the only one in your class and make sure to stay there. And the only wow. way to stay there is by constantly creating things that nobody else is creating or coming up with ideas that nobody else is coming up with. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy, but you can't do the same event for two organizations. It doesn't work. Do, do you I have to spend money to make money in the world of charity? And as we're having a dinner and we're going to spend, let's say, $5,000 on a, on, a, on a comedian that comes in. But if we would spend $200,000, we would make a lot more money. Do you have to spend money to make money in the real world? In the world of charity. No, I'm asking. Oh, and you're asking me. Well, you're, listen, absolutely. Sorry I'm yeah. being so Jewish by no, answering no. your question. <laughs> but, but of course, I mean, it doesn't mean, by the way, that just because you're spending more money means you're going to raise more money. It's also what you do with the talent you hire. So a lot of I, I think a lot of why we've been successful as a company specifically in this space is because in addition to, you know, hiring talent, we also are coming up with ideas of how to use the talent. Right. These these comedians or singers or actors or whoever it is or MCs. They're doing these events every day. So unless you're using them in a way that nobody else is using them, your event's not going to stand out because people have seen it before. Right. Um, 
What's your proudest event? What's a creative event that was so out of the box? No one had done it before. You're really proud. It's a signature Yummy it's, Schechter event. His I next mean, one. There's a lot of them. Uh, I'm definitely proud of Amudim because when everybody was stuck and nobody knew what to do and we were called seven weeks before to, to come up with something, um, I think that the first year we had 700, I think it was 780,000 people tune in to a 36 hour live stream event. That was just amazing. But there, there, there were so many, I mean, I, I produced the, when the Kennedy honors had to go virtual, I, that was something that I'm very proud of. Um, we basically the Kennedy honors is, is a televised event, but it's incredibly exclusive. Maybe there's only 200 people in the room every year. Uh, and the secretary of state comes and the president comes sometimes. Um, and people look forward to this event the whole year because this is like the place to see to see and be seen. Um, I think the people invited are people who give maybe two hundred and fifty thousand and up. It's it's crazy. And there are five honorees each year. Even the honorees themselves, the people who are being honored by the Kennedy honors, even them maybe get two or three seats to this event. Um, and essentially, when they came to me and asked if I had an idea to what to do virtually, I said, "Well, why don't you give?" First of all, you have to make sure to educate people on what the Kennedy Center is and what the Kennedy honors are about and who's being recognized and why they're being recognized. I said, if you would stop the average person on the street, they probably never heard of the Kennedy Center. And if they have heard of the Kennedy Center, they'll just assume, yeah, I heard of it. It's a party for rich people. That's what it really sounds like. Um, and I basically said, if you finally have the opportunity to do it virtually, there's two things you have to accomplish. Number one, don't bother doing a virtual event unless the people who are used to coming are going to have the same feeling that they have when they go. So let's first identify what are those feelings that people have? What do they look forward to? What do they want to see? What, how does it make them feel? Walk me through the experience. And the second thing is, now that you're going virtual, open this up to thousands of people who otherwise would never have the opportunity to have that feeling. So essentially, after hearing everything they did, they you know, were describing about the event. I sent in a camera crew after hours to the Kennedy Center. We shot the center in 300, with 360 degree cameras and we recreated the space in virtual reality so that the guests who are used to coming are walking in the same entrance on the same red carpet. They're hearing a wow. symphony play the theme song Amazing. and they were able to interact with friends of theirs. We had different permissions. So the people who actually would be invited and be there were able to see their friends who they usually see at this event on the red carpet and in the hallways and talk to them. So like, a, a video chat like we're doing now. It, it was, it was amazing. That was, that was awesome. Um, there, there's a bunch. I'm very proud of everything we did during COVID really. How important is it to you to vet the charities, to believe in them yourself? Is it a business that any charity comes to you and you'll just use your creative genius to do it? Or you have to believe in the cause? Do you have to be comfortable with the, with the finances of it, meaning that they're credible, that they don't have too much overhead, that enough is going to what they want it to be going to? Because the world of charity, there's a lot of you know corruption. I was listening to a podcast recently and they were talking about this big scandal because they're... Um, you know, there's Make a Wish Foundation, and then there's like Children with a Wish Foundation, where like only 20% of the money goes to children, and it turns out 80% are going to the people yeah. who started that. And because they've used similar wording and they send out mailers and take out ads on TV, they're just totally fraudulently taking money from people. In the same way, they're like there are organizations for veterans PTSD, and then you know, a little bit similar to that name, you take out a lot of ads, you bring in a lot of money, people are pocketing. So there's a lot of fraud and charity work probably in the Jewish world too. We can talk about that also. So how much do you vet or do you have to believe in what you're going to be working on? In terms of vetting, I usually am working with the principal of the organization and usually it's the founder or someone who's like all the way at the top. So, you know, and, and the organizations we're working with are, are known to be legit. Now it's not my job to start looking at people's books. Um, but obviously if something doesn't feel right or smell right, we're not taking it on. That's number one. The second thing is, and I would say this for anything in life, if you don't have passion for what you're doing and you don't believe in what you're doing, you're not going to be successful. So we have, unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, unfortunately for them, have had to turn away a lot of organizations. If it just it, it just doesn't feel right, we're not doing it. I will not be able to create something. I will not be able to put my heart into something. I'm not going to be able to give you the best version of myself and my team and give you the best event I possibly can if I don't really care about what you're doing. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's a great colo in... Australia for orphaned kangaroos, but it's not, uh, <laughs> not something we're going to deal with. Understood.
Understood. Amazing. You know, you deal with a lot of celebrities. Do you ever go home and, and, and tell your, your family or your parents, you know, you won't believe who I just met. Do they care? Or they, do they try to discard you and say, it's not, no one cares. I don't think anybody cares. <laughs> no. What percentage of the, what percent of the non-Jewish celebrities have you met? Would your parents even know their name? I don't know the answer. Probably close to zero. Close to yeah. zero. Uh, except the Pope. You asked me before we started what the picture behind me is. Uh, I remember meeting the Pope soon after we got married. That's actually a great story. Did I tell you the story? No. Okay. I once posted it. I'm not sure if you saw it. Anyway, I met the Pope soon after we got married. And, um, and we mentioned that we just got married. So he was trying to be friendly. He says, the Pope said, said the one, the Pope who just passed away. He said, um, I don't remember seeing an invitation to your wedding. <laughs> He's trying to be funny. So I said, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because we actually were debating it for, for weeks on end, whether or not to invite you. And we, we decided at the end that it was better not to invite you out of respect. We didn't invite you. He said, why? I said, my father's a rabbi and I wanted my father to officiate our marriage. And I assumed that you don't go to weddings and not officiate. So it would be better not to invite you than to invite you and have you be insulted that you're just, you know, not officiating the wedding. So the Pope said to me, do you study Talmud? I said, yes, I do. Why? He says, because nobody else would answer me like that. How, how have you connected with some of these? I know that you have relationships with a lot of what the world calls celebrities. How did you get in? How do you have those relationships? How do you know when you can leverage them and when not to? Um, I don't know how I got into it, um, but I think um, just from looking back and seeing it, how these people interact uh, with the people around them and how the people around them interact with them. I think they're used to everybody around them jumping the second they want anything or the second they need anything and very few people challenging them and very few people being real and authentic. And when you kind of come into someone's life and you don't care about what they do professionally or their movies or their albums or their this or their that, and you're more interested in their family life and in their values and their beliefs, and you don't say yes to them every time they ask for something and you push back, I think as much as maybe sometimes it doesn't feel good in the moment, you're someone who stands out, right? If, if under no circumstances am I ever going to put you before my family or my religion, that's not something they're used to seeing, I don't think, mm. Mm. right? They know that I will never be away from my family for Shabbos or Yontif. I don't care what's going on. They know that you could call me a million times on Shabbos and Yontif. I'm not going to answer. They know that if I'm with my family, I'm not taking time to speak to you. And I think, you know, over time, that's something I think they respect. And then the conversation is also very different with all these people. You know, I have people who I send almost every Friday. I send a Dvar Torah, not, not in the sense, not, not the type of Dvar Torah that you would necessarily give, but I take a thought from every week's Torah portion. I send it out to mostly people who are not Jewish in the entertainment space. That might be the only real thing that anyone sends them the whole week. That has nothing to do with them or their movie or their tour or their anything. Or making, or making money sharing, or product. Yeah. yeah, it's me sharing Jewish wisdom with you and, and my family's beliefs and values and some thought from the Torah and something nice with you, and that's it. Um, and I don't know if there's many people who interact with them like that. So I guess looking back, that's that's probably how it's done. I don't know. Anyone you haven't met yet who still want to meet? You need an introduction to? I don't want to meet anyone. I, I don't they all find they all find you. you. They find you for through charity bits. No, it's not only through charity bits. But I think once you you know that's it's it's like anything else, right? You're you are friends with someone, and you introduce them to another friend of yours, and then they become friends with those people. It's 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 kind of like a circle. If you're in the circle you're in, and you meet other people at events or at you know different functions, and if you're legitimately friends with someone, people's guards are down and there's a very different start to a conversation or a relationship, either if they know you through someone who they know, you know, would have had the same, I guess, vetting process as they would, or if they saw an event that you produced or, or something that you pulled off that they recognize or respect, then they, they want a relationship because they want some of that too. Let me ask you a question you may not feel comfortable answering, but you know, many people, even even within the Jewish world or the Torah world, they look at some of these celebrities as like they've made it. 
and I wish I could have their life. If I had the money, if I had the fame, if I had the influence, if I had the celebrity status, if I had the lifestyle, that's making it. If I, I, I wish. Having, having an entree there, seeing that the way you see it, um, you think if people knew what that life was really like, they'd want to trade for it? Do you think that life is what it's caught up, you know, what, what people make it out to be? Or is there a lot going on there? There's a lot of emptiness, a lot of hollowness, a lot of they've made it in all those other measures. But, you know, like you were alluding to before, and I've, I've you know, met a fraction of the people you have like this who, who live with the paranoia. They don't know who in their life is real, who has a real relationship with them, who that's, just wants to be friends with them for their that's name. That's the and worst their money. part of it. Yeah, I think that's the worst part of it. Forget about, you know, here's another thing, you know, to a lot of these people, I'm a person who, thank God, has been married to the same woman for 18 years and I have children with her. And I'm always with my family and my family values come for like, that's not normal in any of their worlds. Right. It's unheard of. So like they're, they're, they're celebrating, like, I can't believe that's amazing. That's not amazing. To, that's normal. Right. right. And, and what's normal became abnormal, especially in that world. So um, but but the answer is, if you constantly have to live such a they're so so many of them are so paranoid and so empty and, and searching for meaning and searching for for something more than they have that I don't I many of them. I think if you if you would even offer many of them to trade the fame and the money for just a normal life where people leave them alone. And where they could be who they are and live anonymously and just be happy and have a good family life and stuff like that. I think many of them would trade it in. Um, and I think that's part of going back to what I said before. That's part of what inspired me to start sending out these like motivational messages every week to a lot of these people. Um, because they, they want it so badly, so badly. Mm. People are so thirsty for meaning and purpose. And they're not really finding it anywhere else because everybody else is just yes men. Their job is to make them feel good and get them what they want. And whether it's good for them or bad for them, just do whatever they want and get the job done. But there's nobody kind of giving them any perspective on anything. And I have a lot of these people call me and they'll talk about their marriages and their relationships and their kids and their business decisions, things like that. I'm, I'm by no means a, an expert on any of these things. But the fact is they probably, and I'm a nobody, right? They, they have people who they're friends with for 30 years. They're not calling them. Why are they calling me if they just met me this year? Because I, I don't think they have a lot of people in their life who they could really trust to trust or respect. And that's very sad. Mm. Mm. It's a very, very lonely existence for a lot of these people. Interesting. Wow. Well, you, you certainly have a lot of people in your Rolodex, you know, that you can call at any moment. You seem like the kind of guy that's not afraid to do that. What do you say to people that also know people? Let's say that they're, they're, they're significant people, not celebrities, or but sometimes just afraid to pick up the phone to, to ask them for, for whatever the donation is, or you're just afraid to ask them for, for the favor. How do you do it all the time? Um, I, think, I think with the right approach, you could get a yes from anybody. And the right approach is people cannot ignore passion, hmm. right? When someone's passionate, whether you're really into it or not, when you feel someone's passionate about something and you feel someone really believes in something and their heart is really into something and they really want you to do something, you want that, right? And uh, I, I think that's it. If you, I would never ever call someone and ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself or to do something that I don't personally believe in or that is something I'm not involved in. Because then you're just like anybody else. But I think if you called someone and you're really passionate about what you're calling them about and you have a good reason for calling them and a good you know, reason why you're asking them whatever it is you're asking them, then that can't be ignored. It's very hard to ignore someone who's really into something. So just don't be afraid. Just do it. I don't know why you would be afraid. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I don't know. Like I never ask for anything personally. So maybe that's also a difference. I've never asked yeah. anyone for a personal favor. I'm always asking on behalf of someone else. So maybe that right. takes down the barrier a little bit, right? Because I'm a volunteer the same way you're a volunteer. I'm asking you to do something that I'm doing as a volunteer too. So maybe that's a little bit different, but I, I, I still think that if you really believe in something, people are going to feel it. They're going to hear mm -hmm. it in your voice and they're going to want to be part of it. Can we, can we let we, you leverage some of these relationships both regarding anti-Semitism and Israel, meaning we need prominent people, right? You got you got the Kyrie issue and you've got the the Yay issue, and and these people have enormous platforms, right? Right? Kanye had 
more follow what, what is it more followers on Twitter than there are and like there are Jews in the world. than there are Jews in the world, right? So you're talking about that platform, that voice, right? LeBron historic previously had retweeted someone's lyrics that had an anti-Semitic trope, never held accountable. Happens to be near and dear to my heart right now because our good friend Myers Leonard was just featured on ESPN on, on Sports Center on the podcast, and he's been tried out for three teams and please God will be making a comeback in the NBA. And it's amazing. Myers said one word, w whatever you think about him, nobody ever dug up any pattern of anti-Semitism. He made a mistake. He said one word, a mistake, and he was held to a different standard. I think there are a lot of reasons for that that are unfair to him. And he's a really special person. He's done a, he's done a great comeback. And, and by his connecting with the Jewish community and the relationship that we've kept, he's become a big spokesperson right. and he's using his platform of which he has a, a fairly large one, to represent, to stand up. So could we be doing more? Could the yummy Schechters, and there are more yummy Schechters who have relationships with other athletes, celebrities. And what about Jewish celebrities? I mean, that's often a big disappointment to me. It's like, where are the Jewish celebrities using their voice, their platform to talk about anti-Semitism, to talk about Israel, to stand up for the things that we care about, that, that people, you know, when you look at Kanye, it's not a matter of what he said or tweeted. You see that he tweets, and then in a few minutes, 30,000 people liked it. But the right. truth is that if an equal celebrity in that world would tweet something positive about Jews, 30,000 people would like that. People are just swayed by someone they look at and, you know, and that's the whole industry, right? Like they pay whatever Kardashian to tweet about a pocketbook. They pay her $2 million because they know the return on that just for saying her like in the pocketbook. Nobody cares. You know, so can't we leverage that about... I like the Jews. Okay, now millions of people will like the Jews because the right yeah. person tweeted they like the Jews. Loaded thoughts question. On that? There's a lot in here. Yeah, of course I have thoughts on that. So the the answer is that anybody who has any relationship should obviously leverage it to try to do good for the Jewish community. The first one of the first things I did, you know, in the beginning of COVID specifically when I was starting to produce all these events, is bring in uh, talent that otherwise would never appear on Jewish events, uh, and and bring them in. It wasn't only because of the creativity and originality of it, which obviously I'm going for, but it's also to introduce them to some of what we do. So, you know, the fact that we had, you know, uh, Michael Strahan and Jamie Foxx on an event that I did for Friendship Circle, why, right? But yeah. but it worked. And David Blaine, I mean, David Blaine's Jewish, but David Blaine's not used to doing the High Lifeline dinner. And Kenny G and Michael Bolton aren't used to doing the High Lifeline, you know, concert in Toronto. And uh, Wolfgang Puck and, and Emeril Lagasse aren't used to making kosher dinners for Jewish organizations. But this was, you know, some of what I've been doing. Great ideas. Here, bringing, <laughs> bringing people into our world and showing them what we do. Because at the end of the day, they all have exposure to different nonprofits and organizations, whether they're involved themselves or friends have gotten them involved. But none of them, the, every single person I've ever brought into a Jewish organizational event has been blown away by the volunteers, by the work, by the creativity, by what's being done. Like even Andrea Bocelli, when we were describing to him how United Atzala works with the motorcycles, I mean, he just, he couldn't believe it. And his first reaction was, of course, leave it to the Jews to come up with an idea like this. Nobody else thinks like this, right? So that's, that's number one. Number two is, um, you know, and I've had conversations with Jewish celebrities who have huge followings, who I feel are not vocal enough, um, one of them, in fact, said to me, well, you won't understand my position. So first of all, there was something interesting I heard from, from one very famous Jewish person in Hollywood. She said, nobody in Hollywood is ever going to feel bad for Jews. The Jews, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a saying that Jews run Hollywood, but she said, if you actually live here and work here, most of the people in the industry are Jewish. And we're not going to go into how that started and why that is. It doesn't make a difference. But the point is, she said, you're not going to get if you're trying to play the victim and say that Jews are victims, no one here feels bad for us. And it's just not you're not going to get anywhere. There was somebody else who has over 10 million followers. And I had this conversation with her and she said, you'll never understand the position I'm in until you have a following of 10 million people and you have a brand. And if you say one thing, your brand is done. And I said, respectfully, Hitler didn't care what your brand was. You're a Jew the same way I'm a Jew. Right. And if you don't use the platform that you have wow. to speak up and to defend the Jews and defend Israel, then you don't deserve to have that platform. And you're probably going to lose it by doing something else. Um, Good for you. And then and then there's other things, you know, there are, you know, part of what you 
you mentioned before, let's say LeBron James retweeting something. I think a lot of these people see something. First of all, everybody is running through life now. No one's reading a tweet and focusing it on really thinking on it, thinking about it and, and pondering. And before they retweet, you see something that kind of sounds right and makes sense. You retweet it. That's unfortunately the world we live in and why these things spread so quickly. So I think, you know, I'm not going to speak for LeBron, but I think there's, there's a serious lack of education, both from our community to other communities and other communities towards us. And I think there's, there needs to be a lot of education. There was, you know, someone I could look it up now, but in the tens of millions of followers who tweeted a retweeted a video or shared a video from Louis Farrakhan. And I called hmm. him up and I said, I just saw your tweet, the video you shared. What's the story? He goes, what do you mean? What's the story? I said, do you know Farrakhan? He's like, yeah, I've had him in my house. I said, do you realize that he's one of the biggest, like, rabid anti-Semites on the planet? And he's such a bigot. And, like, why Why would you? He said, man, you don't. Actually, I'm not going to do his voice because then people will figure out who it is. He said, yeah. you, don't understand, you don't understand what he means to the black man, what he symbolizes. Are there things he says that are extreme? Yeah, of course. But overall, what he means to our community, you'll never understand. And I said to him, so let me ask you a question. If the head of the Ku Klux Klan put out a video and I shared it and I gave you the same speech and said, you don't know, you're not white. You don't understand what he means to us. Does he say crazy things? Yeah. But, you know, the, what he means to us is, you know, would you give me a pass? And he said, I'm not going to get into a debate with, debate with you right now, but I hear what you're saying and I'm going to take it down. And I think a lot of people are very afraid wow. to make phone calls like that with people they know. They're always afraid, what am I going to lose? He's not going to be my friend anymore. He's not going to, maybe I'm lucky to be in a position where I don't ask, I don't need these people. I don't ask them for anything. I, I think they all want me in their lives more. I need them and more than I need them in my lives. And I use that to my advantage. I think if you're always in a position with people, especially like that, where you're not afraid to lose anything, then what do you have to lose? You yeah, you can't, well. be, you can't be starstruck 100 percent you get, I mean, you get and, you and the last thing is i mean i assume i mean i know you know but i met a i met a tiktok star montana tucker i i spoke to you about her when we were sitting on the plane together right. um she's actually grew up in boca raton but right. the name montana tucker did not sound jewish to me and from looking at her i never thought she was jewish and the first conversation i ever had with her she's talking to me about her bubby and zadie Hmm. I said, oh, hold on a second. You're Jewish? She said, yeah, I'm 100% Jewish. I said, tell me more about your Bubby and Zadie. She says they're Holocaust survivors. They were in Auschwitz. So I said, have you ever gone back to Poland to see like where your family's from? She said, no, my mom and I have talked about it many times, but we never had the chance to go. So I said, I'm going to send you to Poland and I'm going to send you with a documentary film crew and we're going to do a project. She has, I don't know, 15 million followers on TikTok and Instagram or something like that. And what we did was I sent her and her mother for, I don't know, six days to Poland. They traced their whole family's history. And we made a 10-part docuseries where each episode was only two minutes. Because, you know, I read a statistic that 60% of American teens have never heard of the Holocaust. As a Jew and as someone living in this world, even not as a Jew, that's a frightening statistic. This only happened 75 years ago. Um, so... Um, where are most of the teens hanging out today on social media? What is the content they're consuming and how long is the content and how is it being produced? Whatever that is, we have to follow that format and teach them Holocaust education. So that's what we did. We did 10 days in a row. She did a social media freeze um, every day, just a two minute episode because no one's able to watch for longer than that today. And wow. I think in the first month we had over 10 million views. Wow. And just to, just to show you kind of, uh, how that levels up to, you know, numbers wise, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which is probably looked at as the flagship Holocaust Museum outside of Yad Vashem. But OK, how many visitors do you have? That, do you think they have in a year? No idea. Any guesses? Million. 1.6 million visitors a year come to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And in one month, we hit 10 million people. So. Uh, yes, getting back to your loaded question, I've been trying to do everything I possibly can. There's actually something that came up this week 
I was speaking to Danielle Greenbaum Davis this week. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was telling me that the world Jewish population is, I'm, I'm going to get the statistics wrong, but probably very close, is 0.2% or 0.02% right. of the Point zero two percent of the world population are Jews. Twenty percent of kidney donors are Jewish, and not right. only are they Jewish, majority of the kidney donors are actually religious. And she said, "Imagine if we could get a celebrity who's not Jewish necessarily, who's had some issues with their own kidneys or a family member, something related to kidneys." And off the top of my head, I gave her three names of people that I know who would be great, and have them just put out that statistic. That alone, like you're saying, it's right. no one has to go yeah. and say, the Jews. show by example, show what the Jewish community is doing for society that has nothing to do with Israel. It has Love nothing that. to do with politics, has nothing to do with anything. That right. statistic alone is mind boggling. I love that idea. I love that idea. But let's pivot. Um, you know, you mentioned, and I think this is a, a really, really important point that you're making about your own life and how you have the confidence to have those conversations. You said, you know, I'm not impressed. I'm not blown away. I don't need them. And I, I wonder whether part of that is you've been exposed to real godless and greatness, right? You, your parents, and I, I say your father and your mother, are, are real profiles in, in extraordinary people and great people who've accomplished great things and are, are great, great people. And, and I wonder, has growing up in their home, being their son, being exposed to them, sort of said, you're not going to impress me because you're an athlete or a celebrity or a Hollywood star, I've seen the real deal, right? Hmm. And that, that, that's not to say that there aren't great people outside of the Jewish world or the Torah world, but I've seen truth. I've seen MS. I've seen greatness. I've seen immortality and eternity in people who are the modern representative and symbol of eternity in Torah. I don't care how many followers you have, how much money your movies produce. I don't care. That doesn't impress me. You think there's a connection between the two growing up that way gave you some of that confidence? 100%. I mean, I... I You've been around my parents enough to know that my father is approached by all kinds of people all day and he interacts with all kinds of people. Uh, he doesn't care who someone is or how much money they have or where they're from. His answer is going to be his answer. And the way he talks to you is going to be the way he talks to you and the respect that he gives you and the patience that he gives you. It doesn't matter who you are. He's giving the same thing to everybody. And absolutely that comes from home. My father, I think we're all like that. I don't think any of us are enamored by anybody because everybody knows from growing up in the house we grew up in, it doesn't make a difference. We all put on our pants the same way in the morning. And so what? So you have a lot of flowers. So you have a lot of money. But what do you, at topless, what do you do with your life? That's, right. I think that's that's what I care about. That's what we should care about. Um, you know, I, I my, my tagline for, for years, 20 years has been integrity is currency. Nothing else matters. Show me who you are. Show me what you do for the world. Show me what's what do you contribute to society? Then then maybe I'll have some respect. But just because you're famous, just because you're rich, who cares? Yeah. And, and we're living in a world that so many people, you know, even this industry, it nauseates me a little bit, the notion of being an influencer. And we could get into this now or not, you know, depending where we want to go. But I, I think it's seeped into the Torah world where it's not people who say, that Torah is sacred or I have sacred ideas and I've been blessed with an opportunity to communicate it in a way that resonates and I hope people will listen. But people will say, I want to be an influencer. I measure my life by how many followers I have. I measure my life by, by the statistics of how many views this has or how many likes it has. Or I measure my life by the brand that I've watermarked on someone else's video and made go viral. You know, that, that this world now is defined by this desire to be a brand and be an influencer. And it's seeped into the Torah world in a way that's, I think, really, really dangerous. So don't get me wrong. There are men and women on social media who have real content and real value and who are really humble. And it's not about them. It's about the message. But there are also a lot of people that it's not about the message or the content. It's about them. And I don't know that the, the audience, the spectators, are being judicious enough or sophisticated enough to differentiate out the two and to weed out the two. For ourselves, who do we follow and listen to and watch? For our children, who do we follow and listen to and watch? How do we make sure that we're distinguishing the real content, the real people, and the real values? They're just good at getting it across. I like listening. Or the people who might be entertaining, but but their whole identity is just being an influencer. And when you take that away, there's nothing left. Right. What Very you sad. You know, we have. I'm, I'm in a business. You know, with the charity consignment business has brings us 
you know, uh, in front of a lot of people who will throw money at us to do the craziest things. And a lot of times we get it done because like, why not? We can, people are paying for it. Money's going to charity. Great. There are other times where people call me and I just don't understand what the point of like, why do you want to do what you want to do? And many times I'll either say no, Hmm. even though I can make a quick buck and do something so easy, it just doesn't feel like, or a lot of times I'll give them a new idea within the same realm and say, well, why don't you bring your wife and why don't you bring your kids and why don't we do it this way and that way, this way, what you're walking away with is a memory and an experience and something that you did special with your family. Hmm. Um, and I think a lot of that is missing, unfortunately today. Uh, and the more you give people that rush and that feeling that they're an influencer or you give them something that gives them a rush, all they want is more and more and more. And right. then the second they don't have it, they're miserable. So it's shallow. People are shallow yeah. and that's like a drug with an adrenaline release. Right. And, and, you know, again, you know, you're, you're on social media, we're on social media. Anyone would lie if they don't say that when something, you know, is prominent that you don't get it. Oh, maybe people saw that. Wow. That's so rewarding. That feels good. But it's a dopamine release. It's a, it's not, it's not, it's not real. Right. You know, it's just because many people viewed it and you see how it's all manipulated because you can spend money and get a lot of views. You could spend money in YouTube advertising, Google advertising, Facebook advertising, and and people are confusing, I think, sort of what's manipulated and counterfeit with what's real, and both as consumers of it, and when you have the privilege of being a provider of it, you have a big responsibility to not be shallow, to not get confused in what's real, to remember what matters. I think you got a front row seat to some of that. Well, I could tell you my life from here on in is downhill because once I've been on Behind the Bema, Ah, exactly. I, I don't want any more. I've made it. I've arrived. The peak. This well, is at yeah. the peak in the pinnacle. Well, speaking of that, there's so many popular platforms. Where you mentioned Facebook and Google, and now TikTok. Is there something that, in order to stay relevant in the Jewish world, there's something new coming, or there's something on the horizon that you've already seen is becoming popular? No, I have no idea. I think the most popular thing you could do as a Jew is be honest and be authentic and be real. I love and, that. <laughs> and be good and do good. Uh, that's it. Like none of the platforms are going to do anything for you. When people have interactions with Jewish people that are positive, that's that's, that's going to do more than face anything to face real. Right. Ultimately, when whenever we post anything and I hate to burst your bubbles, but I'm bursting mine at the same time. You know, sometimes we'll go on social media. We'll have a thought. We'll have an idea. We think we're inspiring people. We want to share it. Who do you think is reading it? We're preaching to the choir. It's not making any difference. Maybe it feels good. Maybe you're getting nice comments. Maybe you're getting compliments. Very nice. But at the end of the day, that's not what's affecting the world around us. And that's not what's going to combat anti-Semitism. What's going to combat mm-hmm. anti-Semitism is acting the way we're supposed to act and behaving the way we're supposed to behave and being a light unto the nations. Uh, and unfortunately, I think uh, we're living in a time where we all have to double down on those efforts to make a Kiddush Hashem and, and show yeah. people why Jews are different and why we're, you know, why we are who we are. Wow. For sure. Your, your yeah. father, more of a rabbi of Shechta Shlita, your father, your mother, people know their greatness, their greatness. Your father's greatness in Torah is extraordinary. The greatness in character and Midos. What's something about your parents, something about your father that you think is underappreciated that you wish people knew more, knew better? Um, Probably his humility. I mean, anyone who knows him knows how humble he is. But I think the people who don't know him, if they knew how humble he was, they'd be blown away. Right. I don't know. I don't know if that's that's a good enough answer. I don't know if that's what you were looking for. But um, it took me a long, long, long time to appreciate who my father is. Um, You know, I, I could probably say that for the first 20 years of my life, I probably felt that life was very unfair. Right. I was always the son of I was always expected to do different things and act differently and be different and dress different. And I couldn't do the things that a lot of my friends were doing. And there was always something when making a comment or doing this and that. And it was annoying. Felt very unfair. And I guess from from probably 20 to 40, it was my mission to just become myself. Right. People should know me for who I am, not who my parents are. And then. I reached 40 and then I look back and say, okay, so now I've done everything that anyone has ever wanted to do. And I've met anyone who I wanted to meet and I've done and accomplished and achieved whatever people dream of accomplishing. And now what? 
And I think from 40 was when I was like, you know what? I only am who I am because of my parents. And most of what I learned and most of my ability to interact with people and build relationships and do things for community comes from my parents. So now that everyone knows who I am and now that I did everything, but now who am I? What am I mm -hmm. doing with all this? Right. So basically from 40 on was when I kind of decided, let me take the first 20 years of my upbringing and everything I saw and learned at home and the next 20 years of all the relationship building and all the experiences I had and travel and all that. And let me pull that together and see, well, how do I use all that and, and do good things for the world? And I, I'm trying my best and I hope I'm doing an okay job. You're doing, you're doing wow. great things. You're doing great things. But you know, you, you alluded to, you said explicitly growing up in that home, growing up with those parents, growing up with that last name is a lot of pressure. You know, Baruch Hashem, you have many siblings, you have a large family and distinguished brothers, brothers-in-law. Is there a lot of pressure on you? Like, you know, I've got to produce in Torah, in learning, in, in Sfarim, in teaching, in living up at some, was, was that a challenge? How do you, you to grow up and, and to measure yourself against your father who nobody could measure against. It's so hard. It's so hard. What's what's that like? So first of all, this is another thing about my father that probably people should know. He never, uh, you know, I wasn't a strong learner when I was a kid. I wasn't a good student. I wasn't interested in learning most of my, like most kids. My father learned with me way too much when I was a kid, right? But but looking back, like now I have a chavrusa every day. Now I do that feel me. Like I would have never, ever had the, the wish and the want and the desire to do any of that now if I didn't have that when I was a kid. So when I was a kid, it was annoying. But now it's like, without that, I probably wouldn't learn today. Um, but my father never, as much as he, you know, encouraged learning with him whenever he was around, whenever I had free time, he never, ever pushed any of his kids to be exactly the same way. You know, my siblings, everybody's different. Everyone does their own thing and everybody contributes to their, you know, respective communities very differently in their own way. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned I was in Miami a couple of years ago on Tishaba. And this goes back to this was like right before I turned 40. Uh, so this was before that. Uh, so at that point, it's I established myself as who I am and I had a name for myself. And when people would hear who my parents are, they were actually shocked and surprised. Right. So the hmm. first 20 years was everybody knew who my parents were. The second 20 years by the end of it was, oh, wait, those are your parents. I would have never thought. Anyway, so some guy comes to me. I'm waiting for the elevator right after we finished davening on Tisha B'Av morning. And someone said something and someone said, oh, you know who his father is? And I said, and he goes, that's your father? He hmm. said, yeah. He said, is he disappointed in the way you came out? Ooh. I said, that's disappointed. I said, that's disappointed. And on, and on Tisha B'Av, no less. Right, right. I said, I said, I said, disappointed. Why would he be disappointed? He said, oh, because you're so different than, than your brothers. I said, I'm actually, you know, when I think about it, I'm probably more similar to my father than many of my siblings. And he said, how? I said, we both use our God-given talents to bring happiness and joy to the people around us. Mm. So I said, I think the base of Migdash was destroyed because of comments like that. Uh -huh. And uh, it, was, it was sad, but... Uh, Good for you. He said that. Right. Sorry? That's the kind of guy who's setting back our mission. You know, if that's what he said to you, imagine how he interacts with other people and... Whoever yeah, so don't that. think I got everything from my father. Uh, comebacks like that come from my mother. Don't don't. No question. Me. No yeah. question. No question about that. No question about that. Yama, yeah, we're grateful for your time. This is a really fantastic wow. conversation. Really spoke about so many different things, and uh, appreciate your friendship. We've known each other for a really long time, and I, I will never forget that you and your brother came to the event we did for Israel last year, and uh, you know who that your friends are. Awesome. You know, it's it's not it's not. You don't learn who your friends are when everything's going well and right and everyone's cheering you on and what you're doing is simple and non-controversial. You learn who your real friends are when you need them to show up and it's not so easy to show up. And the fact that you and, and Rav Shai and your brother came that night, we will never, ever forget uh, what it meant to us that night and your friendship on a regular basis and your advice mean the world and the relationship with, with your family, regardless who your parents are, with you, independent of it, is really, really special and something that we cherish. So thanks for going behind the Bima with us. We really enjoyed it. And, uh, there's a lot more, a lot more still to talk about, a lot more to come. Thank complete. you. I've the Kiddush Hashem so that you're making. Thank you we so much, the, guys. We want to see a frame of this on the wall behind you next time. <laughs> uh, I'll put some stuff down. I'll make some room.